time is precious, but it's not like other precious things. You can't hold it like a necklace or taste it like money. Time has existed since before time began. And today, it's all around us, on our phones, in the corner of the news. But once upon a time, if you wanted the time, then you had to come here, to the headquarters of time, Greenwich Clock Museum. All the clocks in the world are set from here, which must take ages. So, what is clocks? Clocks was invented by the ancient Mesopotamians in ancient Mesopotamian times, but they didn't know it were ancient Mesopotamian times because there were no clocks to see what the times was. Because of the shape of clocks, you might think that time goes in a circle, but it actually goes in a line. This is the famous Greenwich Marillion line, named after the band Marillion, who were named after this line. Every day that's ever happened starts exactly here, coming out of that time transmitter and running along this metal line on the ground. That's why this is the only place in the world where I can be in the past and the future, with the present running right up through my middle bits. No wonder time is such a mystery. Literally, no one can understand it apart from science men. One science man who knows all about time is this science man. Hello, science man. Who are you? I'm Dr Stuart Clark. I'm an astronomy writer and a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. What is time? We don't actually know. There are a couple of uh, possibilities. Either time could be a physical thing that, that flows like a river, or it could be more of a psychological thing. When you say it's like a river, what do you mean? I mean that time it flows like the water in the river and that the events in our lives are like things in the river that, 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 that water encounters. Like fish and stuff. Yes. You know when um, you store time on a clock, how do you get it back out again? Because when I was winding my watch up, I accidentally put it forward. So I'd got two hours more in my clock. Um, but I, then I, I put it back. But I thought, is it still in there? Is the time still in the clock? So your watch doesn't actually measure time? Well, it does, because it's, it's accurate. It measures the oscillation of um, a crystal. And the change in the physical state of that crystal has to happen in what we call a certain amount of time. So from one moment to another, physical systems in, or everywhere in the universe changes its state. And that change takes place in what we call time. And that's the only way we can infer the existence of time. But actually what time is, we don't know. Right. So, even the people who understand time don't understand what time is. It'll always be an unknowable mystery, like why the seasons change or how a telephone works. Next time on Moments of Wonder, I'll be asking, what are these and why are they everywhere? One in 20 people has been a victim of crime, which means that 19 out of 20 people are criminals. No wonder we need police. In the olden days, if someone did something wrong, there was nothing you could do except form a mob with your neighbours and hunt them down and kill them. But today, we've got one other option, thanks to Sir Robert Peel, who in 1829 discovered the police, here on a spot marked today by a ceremonial wind turbine. 
Once the police had been invented, victims of crime knew who to ask for help because of their special hats designed to be visible at a distance by people being murdered in the London fog. Police tried to stop crime, but couldn't exist without it. If there was no crime, what would they do? Except spend all day putting addresses on bikes with that hammer. If no one's going to steal those bikes, that's just decorating. Of course, there's no point fighting crime if you don't know what crime is. That's where rules come in. But what is rules? A rules is basically a collection of laws. The first example being the Ten Commandments, which were left on a hill by God. Many of those laws, killing, gravity, and the one about not interfering with oxes, are still used today, even though God's dead. So who decides what's right and what's not right, and works out what the punishment should be, and then writes it down? Maybe an expert can help us get to the truth. Hello, who are you and what are you an expert on? My name is Chris Williams, I'm a senior lecturer at the Open University and I'm an expert on the history of crime, policing and justice. If a policeman broke the law, would he be able to arrest himself? I don't think so, no. Um, under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, um, the arresting officer has to sign the prisoner over to the um, custody officer and if they were one and the same person, I can't see how that would work. Also, I, I don't know how the investigator can interview themselves uh, legally under that act. And if the case ever got to court, which I don't think it would, um, the defendant would be in a position to cross-examine himself. So I, I think the judge would stop the trial at that point. But no, I think it's the answer to your question. When they do reconstructions, you know, on telly, they're dead convincing, aren't they? Have any of them sort of, um, like, got a bit out of hand and turned back into an actual crime? Not to my knowledge, no. It must have happened. Must have. Probably not. They're relatively probably, highly... It probably has happened, though. We'd probably have heard of that if it had happened. All right, OK. So, if there wasn't police, we'd be able to do what we liked, which is great. But then the police wouldn't be able to do what they liked, which is be the police. And that would be against their human rights. Next time on Moments of Wonder, I'll be finding out how all these little flaws make it easier to get between the big flaws. It's almost unbelievable that before Charles Darwin invented evolution in 1859, no one had ever evolved. Without him, none of us would be here today, except in the form of fossils or gibbons. The story goes that here in this garden in Kent, Darwin saw an apple fall from a tree and wondered if there was a monkey up there. And if so, were that monkey? might have come from. Darwin was one of the most famous men of his age, like Paddy McGuinness is now, except Darwin had a beard, which Paddy McGuinness doesn't, unless they use CGI to paint it out, which they probably don't because it's expensive. Even though it's obviously just boring today, the origin of species was the biggest sensation of its age, thanks to the twist ending in which Darwin revealed everyone on the planet had been made out of monkey meat all along. It caused a battle between science and the church that still rages today, although you apparently don't see them fighting like this because it's only a metaphorical battle. Even today, many people still don't believe in evolution, but maybe a science man can put them right. Hello, science man. Who are you and what are you an expert in or on? I'm Mark Thomas and I'm a professor of evolutionary genetics at University College London. What did people do before evolution? Uh, well, there weren't any people before evolution. Um, I mean, life started evolving about four billion years ago. Um, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Because some of those monkeys that lived a long time ago um, turned into 
other monkeys that we see today, like chimp monkeys or, and so on. All right. So the monkeys that didn't turn into humans, they must be gutted that they didn't turn into humans. Right, sometimes when I watch these past life hypnosis programmes on satellite channels, all the people on those, they're always ladies in waiting or gladiators, they're never monkeys. Why is that? Um, probably because they don't actually remember their past lives. It's probably not true. But I find it easier to believe that I was a lady in waiting than a monkey. Well, it's maybe easy to believe that your ancestors were ladies in waiting. The but I, I don't see the problem between believing both that your ancestors were ladies in waiting a few hundred years ago and before that, and before that monkey were monkeys. ladies in waiting. Thanks. Because evolution can't be seen, it's hard to believe in, like electricity or skeletons. But one day, maybe we'll evolve eyes that can see evolution, and that'll prove it's real. Next week on Moments of Wonder, I'll be finding out where clouds go at night. Computers are all around us, in offices, computer shops and computer repair shops. It's hard to think of anything that doesn't have a computer in it, except cows. And they've probably got computers in them now. Computers have become part of our culture. Scenes like this are commonplace. You have to ask the question, are we looking at the computers or are the computers looking at us? Even though the answer to that question is obvious, it sounds spooky. The computer was invented by Charles Babbage in 1822, but it didn't have a screen, so no one knew what it was doing. Conrad Zoos managed to invent a proper one in Germany in 1936, but that one got bombed up by the British. And that meant we could invent it first again, thanks to a man called Alan Turing here at Bletchley Parks in War Two. Unlike today's computers, this early computer is made of transistors and pipes. And as you can see, it's absolutely huge. And the mouse has gone missing, but it must have been the size of a car. The invention of the computer was of primary benefit to one particular group of people, video game players. Oh. Until computers, they'd had to play the games using a pen and paper or coloured bits of dough. A game of Pac-Man could take three days just to set up if the peas kept rolling off the table. The computer changed all that. There's almost nothing a person can do that a computer can't except ride a horse. So lots of jobs have been replaced by computers. Perhaps one day we'll have a computer queen with the real queen just used for the bits that are on a horse. In the future, I'd be able to ask a computer about computers, but for now, I'll have to speak to a human who is an expert in computers. So, are you a computer expert? I'm Dr Sean Holden and I'm a senior lecturer in computer science at Cambridge University. Will there ever come a time where we need two mouses to work a computer? I don't think so. I think it's more likely that there'll be a time when you don't need any mices. Things are moving now towards touchscreens, gesture recognition, um, brain-computer interfaces. So what's that? It's where you can sense, um, to an extent, uh, what someone is thinking. Like Darren Brown? Not as well as that. Right. Well, not yet, anyway. Paul McKenna? You might be able to make the, uh, the cursor, say, the mouse pointer go left or right. Just by, by thinking, thinking, go right. Yeah, that's about where the technology is. But how can it do that? How will it know? I don't understand. It's possible to get some information about what your brain is doing by things like encephalograms. Encephalograms. Done in hospital. What? Encephalograms. Say it again. Encephalograms. Say it again. Encephalograms. Right. So you can get some information about what your thoughts are doing through, through that kind of interface, which maybe means you're sticking electrodes on your head at the moment. Yeah. But it's early days. That's amazing, isn't it? Would you get one of those? Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? 
Alan Turing, the weird man who discovered computers, is now a national hero, and people queue for ages to touch the Turing shroud. There are even computers made of cloud now. What next? A computer you can eat or fight? Computer music? Who knows? It's enough to make you wonder. Next time on Moments of Wonder, I'll be asking where your lap goes when you stand up.